Sophia Sesterberki, international book writing expert and author. I help women to overcome the fear of writing and publishing their books. And I'm so excited to have Astuti Marto Sudircio from Switzerland with me. Astuti is a life coach and subconscious mind reprogrammer who catalyzes the inner journey for go-getters worldwide in shifting success into fulfillment. She facilitates a deep progress to align their conscious and subconscious minds so they connect deeper with their heart and body. Astuti walks her talk. She was an unconscious achievement addict go-getter for decades before experiencing burnout a few years ago. Since then, she lives with a focused purpose while maintaining her health and peace through it. So welcome Astuti to the show. Thank you, Esther. It's really lovely to be here with you today. So let's start. I think your turning moment, I mentioned it already (laughs) a little bit before about the burnout, but maybe there are earlier turning moments in your life, Astuti. I think you're absolutely right. Um, If there is something that I attribute to be a mini death in my life is that. (laughs) So for me, if I were to to, to mark one event um, in my adult life where I restart everything, that was that. Uh, I was working for one of the two major banks here in Switzerland at that time um, in human resources. Um, I This happened, this burnout happened one year after or a few, almost one year after the bank had a crisis, there's economic crisis in Switzerland where the bank that I was working for dropped uh, the share price. And at the time, I was leading a transformation project in the bank. So I had multiple roles of work, uh, maintaining the existing team, running the project, and building the new one. And unexpected situation happened impacting the whole countries, not just our bank, requires drastic actions. And I think... I came from, or I grew up in Indonesia for most of my life and surprises, unexpected changes, crisis happened a bit more often there than here. So I was working with a number of, a lot of uh, European colleagues and a lot of Swiss colleagues who had been working with in this bank for almost their career. And so I reacted differently to the crisis. And I raised my hand up when a big initiative came up and, and I got the, the responsibility that was too much after one year. <laughs> so during that time, for about almost one year, I worked for about 100, almost 100 hours per week. You know, meeting all the ghosts literally in the building because I left the work at 1 a.m. and come back by 7 for almost a year. And uh, so that was it. My body did a coup d'etat, <laughs> stop, and uh, didn't work. One day I just, that I, my brain couldn't connect with the body anymore. I couldn't even ask it to do something that I wanted. And that was the beginning. That was the moment when I felt like, oh my God, I'm losing connection with my body, basically. That was at the end of 2008. That must have been scary. Terrifying. Terrifying. Because I never had that ever in my life. Exhaustion, yes. Lack of sleep, yes. But at that moment when I could not connect my mind with my body and I could not connect with my emotion also. So there's this emptiness that was, I felt like I was a zombie for some time. And that was enough to wake me up (laughs) I I say yeah and it was the hard way you needed to wake up that was the hard way and at the time I was also single so I had to face this in my mind by myself Uh, but this is also part of the realization later as I come back 
mm. uh, to life to life i say <laughs> because you know being feeling like a zombie is a, is a weird feeling you know you can't feel things you move through the motion you move through your day don't feel much and did not feel much so and i i was exhausted emo- physically also very drained very easily exhausted and and stuff like that so that was quite a striking horrifying experience yeah and what did you do then very good question it's a it's a it's a very long journey i think the first step that i did was getting energy back into the body because extremely exhausted so very focused on the physical um health um practically what i did was um i went to see a siatsu person because there's a lot of energetic blockage and it, she was working on me almost every day for at least two three weeks and then she went into three times per, per week and then two times per week and once per month etc once I feel a little bit more and she gave me a lot of exercises to do and as I feel physical a bit, exercise physical exercise yes so and then w- once it was super intense and I did take um it happened around Christmas time. So I had a few weeks off and then plus five more weeks completely just to, to work on this. So my, I had a total about eight weeks, really just getting back into the, the body. And then as I was feeling a bit better, I started to do Pilates with the machine because then it opens up everything. <laughs> the body was so tense. And a few weeks after that, I started another one, which is, uh, it was a, a method called Greenberg method. And this was connecting the body with the emotions. This one, so all these things are parallel uh, for about one year where I could understand better what my body is speaking to me because one of the reasons why the body <laughs> collapsed is because I wasn't listening to what it was saying to me leading to that moment of collapse. So that was the first step. So it took about a, a year and a half for the body to feel normal of course I changed my diet get in nutrition and making sure that I get enough sleep that was also a journey to go back to sleep with meditation just to get the mind slowing down and then I start the second phase which is really the emotional and spiritual healing and this is when I learn deeper the connection between conscious and subconscious mind because I think the situation makes it very obvious to me that I don't want to experience this again (laughs) <laughs> so I made a declaration towards myself. I want to understand how this happened and I want to understand how to come out of it and how I want to understand how I can be out of it for the rest of my life. And so the journey becomes, yes, healing myself, but also learning about how the mind, the body, the emotion, the spirit connected somehow. And in that journey, I had to go back to the heart and face so many things there because the automatic behavior of raising my hand, um, working a lot, achieving a lot, um, sacrificing self for others, this came from unconscious pattern. And if I don't change this on the subconscious mind level, burnout is bound to happen again. So and yes. That's what's happening to many people, to many right? People. Correct, correct. So I think it took so many years. Um, it took probably in all in all to get to the state where I can manage myself, but healing never stops since then. You can you continue to dig deeper, but up to the place where you over <laughs> the surviving line. This probably about three years or so, and it's not uncommon in in burnout. I think I I, I was speaking at um the Global Funds, this is the, the, the organization that uh, managing funding for malaria, AIDS, HIV. Uh, we were discussing about burnout in the organization. And uh, one of the people, the ombudsman or the health representation of the, com- the, the organization was saying, there's a study that is usually it takes three to five years to fully come back, but it doesn't necessarily forbid you from having it again unless you're doing the right thing. And for her who spoke about it, she also had two times burnout. <laughs> so, so it was really important for me. For me, it was like, oh, I, this is it. This is the first and the last time. And uh, that's why I call it the mini death <laughs> for, my, mm-hmm. for my journey. Yeah. yeah. 
if someone is listening now and feeling touched by your story because something inside this person um, ring uh, there's a bell ringing what would you tell this person he listen to the bell that's <laughs> the first thing <laughs> this is always the beginning of a journey is always when it rings that means there's something trusted trusted um my story may not be their story the depth of the issue may not be the same but there's something that needs attention basically and and there's and <laughs> I know I know for a fact and this is not theory because I've gone through it and I've seen it in so many people your heart always knows what is good and not good for you that rings that resonance in your heart that's when the heart is speaking so I was one of those people who was not always willing to hear the ring I had statements in my 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 myself years ago before the burnout this will never happen to me I'm stronger I can take a lot I can take a lot more than most people which was true up to that point but I think the deep voice within me myself says this is not the healthiest option if you were going to sustain yourself for a long time in life with joy and peace because I think around it happened when I was about 34 years old um so and you know when you're entering 30 you start question what do I want what do I want and and you make certain kind of decision without knowing their consequences of your decisions you decide I want to be happier and then your system starts to work towards that and it's basically saying so some things have to go because this are not allowing you to be happy and when we are not listening to the ring at some point the body's going to do it for you <laughs> so listening to the rings is actually a softer landing into the journey that's what I learned I didn't I ignored it until I hit the wall Therefore, I said to people, you know, listen, listen, because this, the heart speaks in response to what you decided, usually, or you, what you wanted, or what you say to yourself, I want this. It sounds so easy to listen to our <laughs> hearts, but why Astuti, is it so difficult? <laughs> it is difficult because it is the unknown and it is scary. <laughs> it is scary. You know, I can tell you from, from my, my experience, one of the things that I had to burn out is because my heart was not fully open. That's um, is if you have to make a summary of, of, you know, what did you learn from this journey that, you know, I was too scared to come into the heart. So the question becomes, why is it? Right? Why is it? When you know that the real truth about what is good for you is there, why don't you want to go in there? And so my discovery and this is what I realize when when I work with my clients is because there are a lot of emotions strong emotions negative emotions there when we come in there that was coming from past experiences okay I can tell you my story that the reason why I became an achievement addict which means I would achieve at the cost of my own health, even though I know it's not good, I can't stop it, I could not stop it, was because there is a fear. There is a fear of losing my loved ones. That's one. And the second that was dominant in there was, there was a guilt for being fulfilled. So this two, fear and guilt, is creates so much inner tension in my heart that I prefer not to go there because it takes energy. And it takes, it will ask you to change something, <laughs> okay? And I, I didn't know that until I went in there, but I knew something was, was um, f having friction within the heart. That was my story. For other people, it's different. But there's something in there that forbids us from connecting deep with the heart because success is not bad at all. I'm not saying that. But fulfillment is success plus something else. Fulfillment is being whatever as you want, you know, quantitative, quantitative things that you, you want to achieve, plus feeling peaceful, feeling joyful, that's fulfillment. Now, you can't get to there without going into the heart. And so 
trauma. Childhood trauma. Mm. That was for me. Mm. Can we go back to the fear? So you said yes. the fear of losing your loved ones. Where yes. does come? Where did come this fear in your case, or yeah. do you see it some in other people? In my case, and for other people, it could also be the same. It could also not be the same. It, everybody has a different story. But in my case, it started very early. I had uh, the trauma during the birth. This is the beginning. So I, my, my mother had to endure a very long birth and I got separated. So I never saw her, touched by her until 12 hours later. So that create a very strong imprint um, in my subconscious mind. That's the first one. And the second one was when I was about four years old. Um, my father had a serious accident that in another town with he was in the car with a number of people and my mom was informed that one there's a person died in this accident but we don't know who this was happening in and 70s so we didn't have mobile phone it was it was really limited so for many hours um she was traumatized because she thought my husband could be that person and i was with her and uh, so i even though she doesn't tell me Everything that is happening to my mother, I would absorb basically at that age. So my father was was not uh, harmed, was not uh, having serious injury, but there was somebody who died. Since then, my parents it, accept that they brush with death and they change um, the way they raised me as a first child. So... At the age of eight, I remember this conversation. They said to me, if anything happened to us, because it almost happened to us, you will be taking care of your siblings. So they raised me to be um, a big sister, but a bit more than big sister mm -hmm. to my siblings. And that over-responsibility became the narrative of my life. Okay, so this is also what explained to me why when there was a crisis in the bank, my my idea was to keep everybody safe as much as I can, safe emotionally, physically, wherever is possible, because that's a pattern. For the people you care about, you take care of them because then when they're okay, you're okay. And then the third thing also that happened in my life was my mother fell ill with a chronic illness, I think when I was about eight or nine. And this was the story throughout until she passed away. So I almost <laughs> lose, you know. So before the age of 10, there were so many possibility that imprinted this fear of losing the people that you love. So you, I, this, the way I reacted to it was, I'm going to do my best to be able to help them. So this is why helping becomes huge. And to take care of myself. Yeah. Just Thank in case they do. Thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned the second thing. Uh, it's about fulfillment and success. What, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yes. yes. So for me, I, in my understanding, I distinguish the two. I think in, my, in an ideal world, success should include peace, joy, happiness. <laughs> In the, in the ideal world, but it's not. Because when we are growing up, successful for each of our family, maybe not in all family, but in a lot of family is good job, good money, house, family, getting married, having children. This is what you are successful. Or you're somebody if you are like this, but nobody is talking about that you feel peaceful as you go through it, that you feel joyful, you feel healthy. Health is often not being even mentioned. And so as I go through this journey of restarting, I start questioning my life. What is it? And actually, as I grow older, it's less of success, but more into fulfill. It's in terms of what I find important is the quantitative, uh, no, the qualitative, which is peaceful, joyful, etc. So a lot of people, when they reach success or when they feel they have achieve certain level of their lives, they start to question. And usually reaching the mid-30s, early 40s, they start to question, is this it? 
why do I feel numb? Why do I feel hollow? Why do I feel, despite of all this money, unhappy, less than happy? It could be tired. It could be all these things. And and this, for a lot of people, is we, they don't know how to, to deal with this because they think maybe this is just how it is. Because it's not educated that <laughs> that you're supposed to be, that life, you are supposed to go through a fulfilling life with ease, fulfilling meaning you're also supposed to experience joy and peace and on all, whatever you want to experience. So this is, this is the difference. And I see this with the client group that I work with. They reach a level where they, they can feel proud about themselves, but they're missing something else. And usually they start to do something about it when there's an emotional crisis <laughs> because then the heart wants to crack open. And that's when we're like, oh, I need, I need somebody to help me process this. Exactly. Exactly. That's the resonance, the ringing that you said, or even a cracking already open. Mm. It's impressive, Astuti, that there are crises, but they are good that they appear. Otherwise, we wouldn't learn in anything Correct. about ourselves. Correct. Correct. Crisis is that. It's... Usually discomfort, it starts with discomfort, the ringing. <laughs> it starts with that usually. But it's, and, and our soul or our, the, the light this, that sparks us, that light that fuel the passion, fuel the, the courage, fuel the, the, the bravery to show up, to, to write your story, to speak up, to, to express your truth, that light. It, we, it can never die down. What it does, it, it sparks or it dims. <laughs> and when it's too dim, it will start to, to knock. It's too much covering here. <laughs> you can, and, and this is when the resonance starts. But when the, the dim is becoming too much, then the, the, the soul is like, okay, I'm going to knock you <laughs> really hard so that you pay attention. And that's when the crisis happens usually. Hmm. it oftentimes it looks like the crisis is coming from the outside i think the people on the outside is just helping it to be a crisis but the the origin of of that is the light trying to tell you i'm too dim for you makes more, more makes more space please so you are more connected to to me basically i love what you're saying astuti <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. So if someone there's still a little bell ringing <laughs> and so what is there a, a simple exercise you can yeah. start with or what what idea do you have? Yes, yes, certainly, certainly. When there is a ringing it's an invitation for you to make time for yourself to sit and listen okay and practically what I like to do I, I go for a walk usually <laughs> if it's possible for some people if not sit with yourself and just imagine this ringing as a person as me and I would just ask what are you trying to tell me? first of all I would ask what is the emotions there is it anger is it fear is it discouragement is it what is it first just sense what it is and um, and then the second question would be what is it about and then you have a conversation and the conversation is almost like speaking to your best friend what is it some maybe it's like I feel like I'm a failure when I couldn't do some things and then you say Okay, what are you failing in? You know, just time to clarify it with yourself and continue doing this again. Ask always the next question, the next question. And then at some point, the idea is to come to this somewhat a statement that says something about you. So it could sound like I will never be enough or people hate me. Or 
no love will ever be enough for me, whatever. And that is that is the 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 gem that you want to go for, that you want to get. And when you get that, you can then acknowledge it that is there, and then you can say, but I know it's not true. Or if you feel like I want to let it go, but I can't, this is the time to get help. <laughs> <laughs> because there's something more intricate underneath that usually but just understanding what it is is already shifting a lot of the grip that this has that you can remind yourself that you're not that or you can start telling something that is more truthful than that to you at that moment some some people say you know say affirmation that is on the idealistic state i partly agree to that Partly not. I think this the body needs uh, much more. It, it is much more comfortable when the statement is more truthful to you at that moment. So go one level above and then say it, and then you know three days later go one level above that, so that the body has time to absorb it and to to change it. But again, if there is like something that's niggling and stubborn and it's still that's when you can get help <laughs> but otherwise you can do this yourself beautiful thank you mm -hmm. for sharing this you're welcome and astuti so we were talking about crisis but once you have your crisis and you overcome it how can you stay healthy and mm -hmm. very good question esther it's an mm -hmm. ongoing journey <laughs> So one thing that helps me is, you know, in the, in the process of coming up, when I was working to reprogram my, my subconscious mind, suddenly in there is changing the beliefs about what is truthful for me or not. Yeah, so I change a lot of like, I have to achieve a lot in order to be loved, for example. Or, you know, when I achieve a lot, I, I, I'm, I will not lose the people that I love, for example. Those had to go. Because the truth of the matter is you will always lose people. They, they have an expiration date. We all do. <laughs> so to, to, to work on this fear of losing them, to let go of the fear on the body, et cetera, through the therapy and the subconscious programming was something I was doing. And then I could, I could instill other beliefs in me that says being healthy keeps you in the longer connection with your loved ones. And then it starts living in my head. So is that living in my body? With that instilled, I can instill a healthier habit for me. It's as simple as going for a walk for 10 minutes. It's as simple as meditation 10 minutes per day. It's as simple as switching off the TV at 9 p.m. You know, it's like, it's, but it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's as simple as doing art. It's as simple as taking 10 minutes to scribble because my mind is very, very strong. So I need it to slow down. And one thing that works with me is scribbling with color. I love color. So I just scribble, scribble, scribble. All these things, it's keeping me healthy. And it's not smooth sailing every day. <laughs> there are times when I was not able to be fully committed. Self-forgiveness is important because I said, look, it's not that I want to harm myself. It's just today. I feel like I want to watch the series and until 10 PM, you know, and, and, and tomorrow I'll do better. So I think there are two things. It's really changing the belief about what is good for you if for what you want. Second, creating the habit. And third, three is very loving and kind in executing the habit. Not so self-judgmental when I don't do certain things that, that I'm supposed to do. And uh, I think for me, being kind to myself is critical, is very, very critical to maintain the health. And there are days that I'm pretty good and there are days that I, I'm not. <laughs> and that's just how it is. And this is so human and yes. you're showing up so vulnerable. This is beautiful, <laughs> Astuti. You're welcome. It's really... I'm like human I, I i i said i'm a, i'm i'm just like everybody else you know i have my good days and bad days and, and it's okay <laughs> mm. yeah. yes and when we don't expect from ourselves to be to have good days all the time then yes we allow ourselves a lot definitely to be human mm. yeah <laughs> yes 
So Astuti, where can people reach you? Yes. So I'm in a number of social media. The first thing is my website. It's the easiest. It has the link to everything. It's uh, My website is www.upliftmylife.today. So that's the main one. I'm in LinkedIn also, Astuti Marto Sudirjo. I also have a podcast channel, um, it's in, you can find it at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the major ones, and you can just look for Uplift My Life Today. And then you'll see that there's a, a lot of interesting insights and knowledge that I learned <laughs> from how to move from success into fulfillment. And, um, and then I'm also in Instagram, Astuti Marto. So yeah, you can connect with me from a number of places, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, website and podcast great and astuti three last truths what would you like to share <laughs> i'm an introvert i'm an outgoing introvert this is a lot of people don't know that <laughs> uh, so i'm an outgoing introvert um that's one thing number two i like um to sleep actually <laughs> like a bear <laughs> and number three I realized this recently I'm actually I actually love artistic uh, activities <laughs> I only discovered this two years ago <laughs> after 46 years convincing myself that I don't like artistic stuff <laughs> so I realized actually I love it so yeah um, a lot of people don't know this either <laughs> wow, <laughs> so, <laughs> wonderful and if you like to share three things which are important in your life and what you teach also your clients, what would it be? Yes. Number one, to, to experience fulfillment, the only way to do that is to come back to your heart, to be connected strongly with your heart. So if you're one of those people like me in the past who is very mind-driven and not connected to the heart, your journey is that it's very simple just go there it's not an easy journey but this is giving you direction coming back to the heart secondly vulnerability is a survival way it's a, a way to survive and thrive okay and because vulnerability is allowing you to be connected to yourself and to your heart that tells you what is good for you or not so it keeps you safe in fact not just safe, beyond safe. So to thrive, you need to come to the intuition. And number two, vulnerability allows you to connect with people, with other people. And when I went through crisis, Esther, the thing, the saving grace for me was the connections with the people that is around me. Yes, I did the work. They're not doing anything for me, but having them around me was so profoundly empowering. And so this is what I said to people. Vulnerability is a surviving and thriving tools. <laughs> and number three, you are human. You are not going to feel happy all the time. To be well is not that you're well all the time. To be well is that whenever is to be able to come back up into well, feeling good, feeling love in the way that is fast than otherwise. Because as human, we are going to always going up and down. There's no way about that. It's just how it is. And so a misconception that people have is to be well is I'm not going to feel sad anymore. No, you're going to feel sad all the time because you're human. Emotions is something that is going to happen, whether you like it or not, because it's an involuntary neuro response. So try, accept that. <laughs> this is, and then be, be, be at peace with it when you know what you're supposed to, what you can do to help you coming up and stay as long as possible in the well-being, then the chance of you having a fulfilling life is higher. <laughs> so that's my three things. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Astuti, for sharing all your wisdom, your experience, your vulnerable points. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Esther, for the opportunity. This is so amazing.